The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Alan Kurtz is Coordinator of Education and Autism at the Center for Community Inclusion and Disability Studies at the University of Maine. He currently directs a similar project designed to make family-centered transition supports available on an ongoing and sustainable basis. Alan was the lead author of three disability-related curricula, including the Maine Employment Curriculum and Quality Employment Supports for Individuals with Autism Spectrum Disorders. Hi. Um... The topic today, uh, as Denise says, family-centered transition planning for students with autism spectrum disorders. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that we had that we did in collaboration with the Institute on Disability at the University of New Hampshire. We had two two-state projects. Uh, when we started doing this, we thought about what kind of what factors are associated with good transition outcomes for students on the autism spectrum and students uh, with disabilities in general. And some of the things that we we looked at and we wanted to incorporate into our project was active student involvement, active parent participation in the process, work experience. And it's interesting. I saw a uh, just saw an article this morning that came out recently that talked about uh, how um, that, like only four in 10 uh, young people with autism have any kind of work experience um, when they're in high school, which is far lower than the population in general. And we know it's really highly uh, correlated with uh, improved transition outcomes. Interagency collaboration and the development of self-determination skills. So our first project, we had um, we had uh, a 24 people in the first year or in the intervention. Uh, we had a control group with 23 students, uh, and students were randomly assigned uh, to either condition. We collected data. We did student and family surveys. Uh, we looked at family and student expectations for the future. We looked at self-determination. We did the ARC self-determination inventory with each of the students. And uh, we used another survey called the vocational decision-making inventory. I analyzed the IEP transition plans. We did open-ended interviews and one-year follow-up interviews. So the project, the family-centered transition project involved parent training. And that took place on three Saturdays. Um, they were usually about three weeks apart, sometimes four weeks apart. Uh, and they were six hours each day. Uh, that was followed up by person-centered planning. And that was between five and nine meetings, usually in the student's home or the, in the young person's homes. Not everyone was still a student. Um, and uh, we did uh, career exploration activities. And that took place uh, from between four and uh, for about four months to six months. Uh, the training that the parents went through was, I mentioned it earlier, uh, the abbreviation, the, the acronym is SPECS. It was Specific Planning en Encourages Creative Solutions. Two people from New Hampshire uh, developed a training for the people in New Hampshire, and they developed another training uh, for the parents from Maine. In it, they looked at post-school options, resources, planning techniques. They had an orientation to planning, uh, emphasizing the focuses on the individual and uh, family-directed decision-making. Assuming personal power, this was a really big part of the training that they did. Uh, and it was designed to help people think creatively and take a lead in planning for their son or their daughter's future. Um, they talked about creative person-centered planning uh, and using that to enhance homework and social opportunities, uh, practical stat strategies for networking, creating opportunities and customizing supports. And that was really a big part of the training. They emphasized that 
when we're looking at the transition of students or young people on the autism spectrum, it's really important to customize what we're doing. Uh, we shouldn't be looking for programs per se. We should be looking at what does the person need and building the supports around them and customizing that. Using resources widely, creatively, and using a wide range of resources. And finally, getting to the action, creating a meaningful and uh, uh, I missed a word there, creating a meaningful support network and a routine for their son or daughter after high school. And this is something they really emphasized in the training and that we emphasized throughout the project was we need to think about what before how. And our experience has been that with a lot of planning, people jump right into the how and they look at what kind of services do we want for this person? Uh, and they're not looking first at, you know, what do we want for the individual? What does the individual want for herself or himself? So we did, as I said, we did person-centered planning as well, six to nine meetings. We did it over an extended period of time. Um, our experience with person-centered planning uh, in our state and in both our states and in, in some other places as well is that it tends to be one meeting a year. Uh, sometimes there are quarterly meetings, um, but it's mostly just to uh, reaffirm that people are going to get specific uh, services. It's not very that, it's not really that creative. Um, the focus in the planning was identifying a specific transition, specific transition goals and an implementation plan. And this is a big part, this is one of my pet peeves with person-centered planning as it's typically done. Um, we often fail to identify people in the community. We often fail to work on expanding uh, people's net, people's networks um, and their their inclusion in the community. And you know, we felt that was uh, an important part of person-centered planning that we wanted to incorporate into what we did. We also had peer mentorship as an option. We had two people in the project, one from New Hampshire, uh, one from Maine, uh, who were on the spectrum, uh, who were involved sometimes in co-facilitating meetings. Uh, the person from Maine. Uh, often met one-on-one -on -one with uh, uh, some of the people in the project uh, to provide support to them. This is an example from one of the person-centered planning meetings for Matt, and that's a pseudonym. Um, and uh, it's just looking at who exists in his life right now. Who are the support people? That's a common activity that we did. Inviting others to participate in the planning Again, we uh, felt that person-centered planning should be used to expand people's network, to uh, help, you know, to identify allies in the community and people who can help uh, the person and help the family um, achieve their goals. So we have one individual, um, and I often think of him, um, for a lot of reasons, but uh, he was um, um, someone we were we had we're having a meeting for him. He's someone who really enjoyed cooking. Um, he had a bunch of cookbooks in his home. He collected them. Uh, his communication skills were not all that sophisticated, but he did like to read cookbooks, and he used to cook gourmet feels, uh, uh, meals for his family. And um, we were having a meeting with him. This is, this is in a high school vocational class. Uh, this picture was taken. Uh, we were having a meeting with him and his family and we asked him, you know, where would you like to work? And um, he said, um, uh, KFC, McDonald's, Burger King. And we were all thinking, well, that's, <laughs> you can do a lot better than that. And we talked about, you know, where could he get some experience? Who could we connect with? And we started talking about people we knew at a local college, which was known for its, its uh, incredible um, uh, uh, dining services. And uh, we started talking about the people we knew and who we could connect him with. And uh, eventually we came up with a plan. He got an internship um, and uh, it was actually a paid internship that was very successful. For him. Understanding what works doesn't work. This is just another 
uh, person-centered planning tool. Um, for this person, we looked at learning style, what works for him, what doesn't work. Um, we looked at, you know, in general, what works and what doesn't work for him. Um, you know, he says in here that artwork works for him, uh, routine works for him. What doesn't work is animation. I think of one person, uh, we were in a meeting and uh, he sort of came storming into the meeting. He was livid about the fact that um, his uh, vocational rehab counselor had set him up with a work experience working in a kitchen. And he said, doesn't she know? I need to work outside. I need to work in a place that's quiet. He was going on and on like that. And I said, okay, why don't we come up with an activity where we can explore this and we can, we can talk about what your voc rehab counselor needs to know. And that's what we did. What does this person's voc rehab counselor need to know about him? Uh, he, we developed that and he shared it with her and uh, the next few placements were much more successful. Setting goals in a variety of areas, uh, work, home, social recreation. We encourage people to think really creatively and in the long term about those things. Uh, this is an example of a post-school plan. Um, it included for this person, uh, Matt, being accepted into a program uh, preparing him for college. Career exploration. We tried to link that to the evolving planning process. So through the process, we were trying to find out, you know, what are the person's interests and explore those interests. And once we began to explore, we found sometimes, well, maybe the person isn't that interested after all. So that fed back into the planning process and then the planning process fed into what we were doing around career exploration. Uh, the assistance that we have provided included connecting it to other service plans. So if somebody was receiving adult services, if they were still have an IEP, uh, we tried to connect with people to make that career exploration uh, activity, those activities part of those other plans or to extend those things. Um, you know, included in doing things such as inter informational interviews, job shadowing experiences, online in-person investigation, post-secondary education options, and paid and unpaid work. Um, we had one young man who was uh, very interested in studying biology, um, and we got him an internship. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was somewhere on the main coast doing some kind of research, and he, he just loved it. He went on, um, got an associate's degree at a community college, um, then went to uh, a four-year college, a four-year university uh, to study biology, uh, got a job in a lab that paid for his courses. Uh, so he was someone who was really successful. This is another person, this is a person um, who was in the project uh, who didn't have, whose um, uh, communication skills were, were fairly limited. And he's not somebody we could ask, um, you know, what would you like to do? What do you see yourself doing with your life? So we tried a lot of different things for him. One thing we knew about him was he liked to go on this community trail. He liked to walk and hike on this community trail. And so we thought, you know, well, there are people out there who volunteer to work on that. And maybe he would enjoy volunteering for that. So his parents took him there. They brought bottles of water that he could share uh, with the other um, volunteers. Uh, they thought this was going to be really good. Uh, he didn't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> the trail was for walking, um, for hiking for him. Uh, he didn't want to have anything to do with working on it. But it's something we learned, and we learned a lot you know, about him and uh, what kinds of things uh, he enjoyed doing uh, by experimenting with different things. This is a man, young man, person on the right, initially told us he was interested in filmmaking. We got him, we got him some uh, uh, experience working with filmmakers uh, locally. 
he decided that's not what he liked. He ended up uh, working in a graphic art studio or doing an internship in a graphic art studio uh, and uh, really connected with the people there. Um, he's someone who went on and studied graphic arts in college. So for our research, uh, we, like I said, we had uh, two groups. We had the control group and the group that got the, the whole package in the first year. The control group got the package in the second year. And we found that there were significant improvements in student expectations or significant increases in student expectations for the future, parent expectations for the future, self-determination, which as many of you know, is uh, very highly correlated with positive um, uh, transition outcomes and uh, vocational decision-making. I looked at the IEPs um, using uh, the something called the Statement of Transition Services Review Protocol um, and uh, found that there was a significant increase or a significant improvement in the IEPs or the, the transition plans uh, for the students who are in the project. There was not a significant, significant increase for the students in the control. We also looked at participant accommodations. David Hagner, I should have mentioned earlier, he was the person who actually um, uh, conceived of this project, is, um, was from the University of New Hampshire, is retired now. Um, he and I um, uh, interviewed some of the facilitators who worked in our project, the people who facilitated uh, the planning meetings. And we asked them, what kind of supports did you provide to students, and these are some of the things that they did. Um, you know, sometimes it was just building informal rapport. For one person, it meant going to a store with somebody to look for a book on Disney cartoons, or sitting in their kitchen with them and eating ramen noodles. Some people wanted distance attendance, and this, a number of people wanted this. One person participated by Skyping from his bedroom. He just didn't want, want to be overwhelmed by sitting in a meeting with all those people. Another person sat on the steps, at least in the first few meetings, and gave a thumbs up or thumbs down to different ideas. Individualized preparation. Uh, often met with students prior to the and how they were going to participate. Flexible meeting designs, opportunities to take breaks. Sometimes people said, well, I'll participate for 15 minutes, and then I'm going to need a break, and then I'll come back. Uh, joining to make a presentation, one person uh, with the mentor, uh, the peer mentor working uh, with him, created a PowerPoint presentation to, for, to talk about what he was interested in uh, in his adult life. And uh, um, they made that together. The mentor made the presentation, but uh, uh, the young person chipped in now and then to make some comments. Attending only at the end um, for a 10 to 15 minute briefing or a question and answer session. We had a number of people who told us in our first meetings, I'll be part of this project, but as long as we don't say the word future, as long as we don't talk about planning, as long as we don't say independence. So for them, there were trigger words that we just had to avoid. We did end up doing planning and we did end up talking about their future. But you know, in the beginning, we had to avoid using those actual words. Supportive participation, periodic check-in with someone who's using an augmentative alternative communication system to ensure that they had time to communicate. Um, for someone who, whose speech was hard to understand, uh, team members repeating what he had said and he would give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to confirm whether they got it right or not. Commenting through post-it notes instead of speaking, and that was a student who preferred doing, who preferred writing to speaking. In the family interviews, we found some interesting information. Um, families said it kept fam them on track. Um, many felt overwhelmed by the transition process, and this broke it down into discrete tasks that they could uh, address one at a time. Some people talked about how it modeled tenacity and perseverance and working towards goals, and they loved some of the stories that were told as part of the training uh, that they received. 
It helped connect families with other supportive people. And people, a number of families talk about how, you know, they used to think of planning for their child as something that just sort of happened in a bubble, you know, and they started thinking about how we can reach out to people. Um, the person I showed you who was cooking, um, his mother um, wasn't somebody who felt like naturally she could reach out to people. But after the training, she was really motivated. And uh, her son wanted to get a driver's license. And uh, he had gotten an evaluation uh, and was told he probably wasn't a good candidate for driving, but she believed otherwise. She went out and she contacted a um, uh, driver education school, uh, talked to the woman who ran it, and the woman said, sure, I'll do that. And if he's not successful the first time, we'll try it again. And, you know, you, we'll do it again for free. Um, so he went through driver training. It only took him once. He got through it. Uh, one thing they were worried about was his being pulled over. You know, could he handle being pulled over uh, if he was getting a ticket or something? And uh, they weren't sure how they would handle it. So they contacted a state trooper they knew who practiced pulling him over. Um, so that worked out pretty well for him. Um, uh, she sent me a picture not that long ago of him standing next to his car with a big smile on his face. So that was great to see. Um, people said the planning was growth enhancing for the students. Uh, they learned to advocate more for themselves and take an active role in their own planning. And again, that was something people really didn't want to do. And a few of them really didn't want to do to begin with. Um, there were feelings of discomfort. Uh, but as one person said, nobody grows up without a little bit of tension. Families became more clearly aware of students' strengths and potential. Um, people had trouble imagining things like their child having a driver's license or driving to the prom with their date, having meaningful job skills, taking college classes, and all those things happen uh, with, with some of the participants in our project. Uh, families learn to think outside the box, especially when accessing various resources. Um, they began to think about typical resources like friends and relatives, other community members, clubs and teams, and using technology such as iPads. And not just like thinking, well, we need to connect with the rehab, we need to connect with adult services. Uh, they started to think more broadly about who they would connect with. Uh, also looking at formal resources in non-traditional ways. One example was uh, high school providing transportation to a community college during the students last year. Experiences with formal adult services were mixed um, with, some, uh, with some disappointing experiences with adult services. We followed up with 25 of the students uh, or the young people um, who have participated in the project. Um, this was a few years ago, um, but they were averaging 906 an hour. 68% uh, had a paid job um, and uh, a high percentage of them uh, were in post-secondary education. Let me just say, you know, we didn't have a random sample of autistic students. Um, yeah, I, we, we recruited through schools and I think uh, some educators sort of served as gatekeepers thinking about who was appropriate for this project and who wasn't. And I think we tended to have uh, people um, in the project uh, you know, with higher academic skills or better communication skills uh, than would be typical on a random sample of this population. So I want to keep that in mind when I show you this information. So we concluded overall family-centered transition planning leads to a significantly improved outcomes over traditional planning for individuals on the autism spectrum. Uh, we had a second project where we worked at trying to uh, blend different resources and try to create a, uh, a self-sustaining project working with different organizations. We worked with one organization in California, uh, several within our own states. Um, that had moderate success. Um, 
we're working on that right now, and we've made a lot of progress in the last year on that. Um, we went, we tried to identify some orga organizations more recently uh, who we could collaborate with, so we could provide training and support to families around transition planning, uh, and do that in collaboration with those organizations. Um, and we wanted to develop a main specific curriculum, and we wanted to expand it, given some of the things we've learned. Um, or that we think uh, would help with transition that we didn't address so much um, in our first project. And that includes uh, greater emphasis on self-determination. And even though we did see an improvement in self-determination skills, I think there are a lot of things we could do to focus uh, more um, directly on that, the use of assistive technology. Uh, we've had some uh, interaction with the Autism Society of Maine, um, we're still exploring that. We think that they would be good. They have, um, uh, they hire a number of people uh, who go out and work individually with families and we'd like to work with them in co-presenting this information so that they could provide that support around transition. The kinds of, these, the same kind of supports that we provided through our project. Uh, in the last year, we've worked a lot with the Maine Parent Federation, uh, which provides a lot of information and resources uh, to parents of people with disabilities um, throughout our state. And they've um, reviewed a curriculum that we've developed. They've made some suggestions. We've made some changes to the curriculum. It's a transition curriculum. Um, the plan at this point is to begin implementing that in the fall. Uh, it includes an introduction. A history of disability supports. We want people to understand, you know, where we've come from, from the days of institutions um, to uh, where we are today. We have a section in there called New Visions, where we talk about um, some, um, what we think are some progressive ideas that uh, uh, people are exploring now, or ways that we think uh, the field is moving. Uh, supported decision making, for example, is one of the topics we cover in there. Uh, we talk about funding home and community supports in Maine. Um, we do a big section on person centered planning, uh, self determination, employment supports, and exploring assistive technology. So, again, the idea is that with the Maine Parent Federation, they, ha they also have people who go out, support families. We want to do some training with them, uh, co-train, and then they will be providing ongoing support to families. And the kind, the kind of support that we provided through our person-centered planning meetings. As I said, we, have a, we want to do a greater focus on self-determination. Uh, we had a program that we've done for two years now called the Step Up Program. It's a program at the University of Maine where we work with students who are interested and going on to post-secondary education, students on the autism spectrum. Um, we did that last year and they were on campus. Um, it was a small group, uh, it was fairly successful, um, but it um, one of the topics we covered was self-determination. And we, you know, we talked a lot about that, but we started talking about self-determination. We decided this year that we were going to adopt the self-determined learning model of instruction. Uh, that's something, if you want to find out more information on that, you can go on Google, you can go on Google Scholar. Uh, Michael Waymeyer, Kerry Shogren from Kansas have done a lot of work around this. And there's a lot of research that's come out really in the last few years uh, showing the effectiveness of this. We tried to incorporate that into our program this year. Um, working with the focus person, the person for whom the planning is being done to identify her, his specific goals in multiple categories and a plan for achieving them. So um, we covered a lot of different topics in our project, but we wanted to say, okay, we're talking about assistive technology. What kind of goal do you have around that? What do you want to learn and how are you going to accomplish that? Um, we have one person um, who, uh, came up with several goals. She wanted to learn how to use text to speech and she learned how to do that. She also says she wanted to learn how to make friends when she goes to college. So she's doing some research about that and finding out what other people are saying about that. 
and she's learning how to manage time, which is another goal that she identified. Uh, one person just wanted to succeed in the class, the university class that he was taking as, as part of the program. He also wanted to learn how to pay for college and how to explore scholarships. So he developed some goals and a plan for achieving those goals around that. Another person uh, just wanted to identify technology uh, that might help her while she's still in high school uh, and learn to make her own medical appointments. So we had a wide variety. Um, I think as we implement family-centered transition planning with the Maine Parent Federation, hopefully, hopefully with other organizations, we really want to incorporate that self-determined learning model of instruction into it. So it's really interwoven with everything that we do. Um, uh, and we also want to be able to work with families um, to ensure that support for self-determination and self-determination self instruction is incorporated into the IEPs. Um, I looked, I examined over 45 IEPs as part of two projects, um, and I found two that mentioned self-determination, even though we know that self-determination is uh, really important, uh, is a really strong predictor of good uh, transition outcomes. So we think, um, uh, what we'd like to do when we do our training for families is talk about the kinds of supports, kind of training uh, they can do to support self-determination for their family member, but also give them information that they can share with schools and things that they can ask for uh, to be part of the transition IEP. Uh, the Maine Parent Federation suggests that we do more. Uh, uh, we many more, pe many more people could be involved with this if we did it online. I wasn't really a big fan of online training, but um, we had COVID-19. <laughs> so our training, our, our step up program this summer was online and I think it went very well. Uh, and I think the Maine Parent Federation's idea uh, about doing it online is really important. Um, we did our trainings for families on Saturdays. Um, and, you know, not everybody could make it. Um, uh, we, and, uh, you know, it was in a, particular geographical area that some people would find it hard to get to. Uh, so we think that it really is a good idea to try to do this virtually. Uh, I think even the person-centered planning component uh, virtually. Um, we're also doing a social and distancing project at our center, and we're learning a lot around that, uh, around doing uh, supporting people virtually. We're working with people with a wide range. We're working with people with a wide range of um, uh, disabilities, uh, developmental disabilities, uh, to learn how to connect with other people online. So we're learning a lot about that and what kind of supports people need to do that. And uh, um, uh, it's not only the people with disabilities, but the people who support them often need a lot of training and support as well to make that happen. Um, if you have any questions about this, you can email me at um, this email address. We have, I'm, this has gone a lot quicker than I thought it would. So we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, these are um, three pieces of research that talk about our project. And, uh, if you're interested in learning more about it, some of the details, you can um, look those up or I can send them to you. So the first question that we had, this will be an interesting one and probably one that you've run into with some of your students. Um, my son really only likes video games and he's not motivated by much else. I have not found a way to communicate with him about other interests and work life. Have you helped families with this, or do you have suggestions of where parents could look for more information about how to address that? Um, the most common um, job that people thought that they might would that would want to explore was designing video games. <laughs> that was really really popular. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I know that uh, even though a lot of 
the people we worked with initially said that, you know, I'm only interested in video games. Um, you know, as we began exploring over a long period of time, uh, that changed and people started talking uh, about other things and started, you know, demonstrating other interests. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any answer to it. Uh, um, you know, it's, um, and getting people motivated sometimes just means getting out there and doing something. I think, you know, that's what the exploration was all about. Um, and people learned that they liked things that they hadn't uh, considered before and they learned that they uh, didn't like some things that uh, they thought they might want to do. So, uh, yeah, I don't have an easy answer to that. Um, just to say that um, we saw that a lot. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, um, people move beyond it. Okay. And and so working through that process and patients maybe realizing that at 16 or 17, that right. may not be the end of the end of the story. And the first time, and the first time you ask somebody what they like to do or what else they might be interested in, you might not get anything. Um, but you know, I we had in our in the first year we had one student who was in a person-centered planning meeting, and. Uh, uh, the facilitator asked him what he liked to do. And uh, I think he was being a bit sarcastic when he said, I like to break things. And his mother jumped in and said, oh, no, you don't really mean that. But the facilitator and, and the person on the autism spectrum who was mentoring uh, and co facilitating the meeting, they said, oh, no. Look. And um, he said, uh, uh, you know, so they were talking a little bit about that, and someone said to him, can you think of any jobs where people break things? And he said, no. But then he, I mean, he had been really withdrawn from the whole process. He started pointing, pointing at each person in the room and asking them, can you think of a job where people break things? And they answered it. And all of a sudden, he just became really involved in the process and began, you know, thinking about what he might do. And I think uh, part of it was just, people demonstrating that uh, that they really um, um, were listening to him and uh, they were going to pay attention to him. One parent wrote in that um, their family used Trivial Pursuit on video games and then mixed in a few other questions that weren't video game related. So they sort of embedded it. They, they were sort of sneaky about it. So. So that was one way that they did it. They they uh, wooed him into talking about other things. So that's an idea. Uh, one person is asking about interest inventories to identify what they would like to do. Are there specific batteries that people can use or tools? Or you mentioned books. I know. Uh, are there things that parents can grab that they can use for that? There are, but I can't think of any specific ones off the top of my head. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> it looks like a beautiful day there in Maine. And uh, yeah, you're not sitting in your library on campus like so many of people were all working at home. So it's definitely a different time. Um, this person is asking about this process in terms of IQ and verbal ability. And you touched on this a little bit. So specifically, um, it, it I would imagine it works most effectively with students with uh, lower needs in terms of verbal ability or, or who have higher IQ scores. But you also mentioned some students who had some communication limitations were, were involved. So yes. what, how, how, what's the difference when you're doing that and, and uh, how would parents pursue that if they've got a, a loved one who needs a little more support? Well, I, I think of the, the one person uh, who I talked about, who we had to make some inferences about uh, his interests. You know, we knew what kinds of things he, were in, he was interested in. So we, you know, we said maybe we can try some of those things, try expanding those things like we did with the hiking and seeing if he would volunteer. Uh, we knew from school uh, and from home different things that he was interested in so we could start there. And that's where the exploring, the career exploration came in, uh, where we could go out and try things and uh, see if our inferences were correct. Okay. 
So you're in Maine, but I'd imagine a lot of communities have resources along these lines. How do parents or families find organizations or campus resources that can help them through this process? I mean, are, are there online courses right now during COVID, books that are very directive and give step-by-step? -step? What, what are the steps they might take? Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> there's no book or there's no um, uh, outline um, step-by-step process. Um, I would certainly be happy to talk to you if you want to email me. Um, and, you know, I could share the curriculum that we developed. I mean, it's main specific, but a lot of it is general enough that it would uh, apply to people in any state. And if they wanted to reach out within their own states, maybe a place to start would be with their um, local ARC or Autism Society or different yeah. different advocacy yeah. groups there who may have that information. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how about well, families? I'd I would be, I would be happy to help anyone who wants to try to uh, develop this process. Um, how about families in rural areas? So the the differences in what sorts of opportunities and and um, training in those areas are go going to be different. Were any of the participants in the study in rural areas, or were they all very specific to the community where you are? Uh, most of Maine is rural. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, the majority were in rural areas. Uh, some wet, some isolated than others. Um, I can think of one family that was in a very rural area. It was very difficult uh, for us to find some good opportunities for him. Um, but we did find some. Uh, one was actually uh, doing an internship with his father who inspected houses. Um, so we, we just had the search a little bit harder to uh, find some opportunities. I mean, the good thing though, oh, the, I forgot, he also um, uh, did an internship working at uh, the local store, which was about uh, a half a block from his house. And the good thing was that uh, everybody in the community knew the family. So when they, they talked to the people who owned the store, uh, it, was, it was a nice fit, it went really well. And they were very happy to do it. So in rural areas, have you seen any success with farm setups or any sort of animal activities? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, again, I think of one family in particular, um, uh, young man um, lives on the family farm. Uh, he moved out of the house. They got a a, 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 uh, a mobile home for him that they set up. So he lives independently uh, and he works on the farm. Um, but he's still, you know, close to his, his family and the supports that he needs. Um, I can't think of anyone else for the moment who's done that. Okay, when we talk about self-determination in people who are nonverbal, mm -hmm. uh, how, how do we identify that, I guess, and um, how do we define that for somebody who's got those more limited communication challenges? I, you know, that, that's really individualized. Uh, um, you know, again, I think a lot of it has to do with um, uh, you know, learning by doing and exploring, um, you know, uh, I, I, I have a very close relationship with someone um, who lived in my home for 11 years and uh, I still see him um, uh, at least weekly. And, um, you know, I have a pretty good idea of what his goals are. Uh, you know, he wants to be able to uh, 
listen to his own music, listen to the music that he chooses. Um, he wants to have opportunities to um, uh, get in his hot tub or use his hot tub. Um, and uh, he wants to uh, spend some time interacting with people in his community, but he wants to do it on a limited basis and on his terms. I, I, I think, you know, just as, as um, um, we have to, in some cases, really infer some goals or, uh, you know, if a person even has a yes, no response uh, through an AAC, AAC system or a um, 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 yes, no, I don't know response, uh, we can check with them. And we had those people in our project who uh, really weren't talking in the meetings, but they give a thumbs up or a thumbs down about different ideas. So I think, you know, even just so the yes, no, uh, and I know that it's, it's tough to get a reliable yes, no from some people, but um, um, you, you can you can infer some, um, you can infer some goals um, and try things out and uh, uh, see if your inferences were right. It's a lot harder. Yeah, certainly when someone can't tell you, but I, I think it's possible. And when people right. are getting together, you know, six to nine times and practicing and doing different things in between, the process gets a lot more creative than if you have that one meeting a year where you say, okay, these are the goals we want to work on. And then a year later, you come back and uh, review how the person did. Uh, if you're meeting six to nine times over six months, you know, you're trying different things. And the person's trying different things. You can get a much better idea. About, uh, or what the person wants. Okay. This next question is about, you had mentioned that you had some success placing a student at a store to work and they're asking about how to approach and encourage businesses or organizations to work with neurodiverse youth or, or kids who, are, who have verbal communication limitations. Um, I think you just do it directly. I, I, I think of, you know, the, the mother I talked about earlier who was really reluctant to, to you know, really reach out to people. But she was in a store and she saw someone um, with an apron on, you know, in the, um, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a grocery store and the guy was in line at the checkout. And she said, well, I'm, I'm gonna take the initiative. I'm just gonna go up and ask him where he works and if he has any ideas about where my son could work. And she did that and she reached out to the driver training school. Um, and you know she reached out to the state trooper and she did a lot of things that were a little bit uncomfortable for her but i i guess what we saw was that yeah there were certainly people who said no they weren't interested but i think the community was much more welcoming uh than we had ever thought i i think you know emphasizing the strengths that the person uh will bring to it um you know if a person you know, is very meticulous in their work. And we know a lot of people on the spectrum are, you know, you can emphasize that as a strength of theirs. And there are people who will really appreciate that and need someone uh, who's going to be very meticulous. So you're is talking about, question? right, finding those special niche abilities that maybe people overlook. Yeah. yeah. Right, this parent is asking about um, their loved one has a difficult time following more than one or two step tasks. So have you worked with any individuals who maybe had those those auditory processing issues and maybe needed either more direct support and, and what was successful in that case? Yeah, um, we, um, um, we worked with one person uh, who his, his mother described as very prompt dependent he worked in a hardware store and he knew how to do each task, um, but he needed a prompt each time from a person. Um, and we tried a couple things. Uh, one was video modeling, uh, where we uh, um, 
took video of him doing different tasks and we cut out the part where the person was giving him the prompt so he could see himself completing the whole task. He was putting seeds in bags um, uh, for people who were gardening. Um, and uh, the other thing we did was um, we came up with, we used some technology on a, a phone. I forget what the technology was, but it was used to uh, prompt him to go from one step to the next. All right, so it was something that, that so a person didn't have to stand there, it would actually help them right, right. navigate now, the process. Did I answer the question? I think so, yeah. You're saying that, that, that they sort of synthetically created a, a prompt method that yeah. so someone didn't have to stand there and do it, and, and that worked well for him. Yeah, yeah, and I think along with the video modeling, where he could see himself completing the whole step, yeah, uh, or the whole process, uh, okay. without any prompts for the individual steps, worked really well. Okay, this is actually a parent overseas who is asking about uh, two things: asking one about just helping their loved one understand autism and understand how to ex how to navigate with it, but also about self-advocacy. So you talked about self-determination and um, what are there aspects of self-advocacy that, that were part of the program or is that is that another aspect of things to tackle? I think it was implicitly part of the program. Um, I mean, we were, we were supporting people advocating for themselves. Uh, I don't think we addressed it as a topic. I think in the future we will probably along with self-determination um i know in this in the, our project that we just did this summer uh for the students interested in going on to college a number of people were very interested in self-advocacy um uh, and we had shared some information with them from the autistic self-advocacy network asan uh and they were in, very interested in pursuing that uh especially a document they had created about uh, uh, navigating college. Reading people like Temple Grandin and others, um, you know, um, we'll often show people, we'll often show people videos of Temple Grandin, we'll show them videos uh, of other people on the spectrum who are advocating for themselves uh, or have been successful in various things. And uh, uh, I think that can be really motivating for people. So when you think about the participants in the in that program, were there any sort of, if you had to pick out two sort of phenotypical aspects of personality that were the best indicators of future success, were there any things that in particular were consistent across students who did the best or had the best outcome? I think having very strong focus of interest was one thing um, and I think coming in to the program with some self-determination skills and the ability to set some goals for yourself I mean I think those skills increase but you know naturally those people who um, um, had some of those skills to start with uh, made greater progress as I think about some of the people who've been most successful, um, you know, they, they were people who had, you know, a fairly clear idea of what they wanted to do. Okay. So, and not necessarily video games <laughs> in the right, long run. But, but we did, I mean, I, that first year, almost half of the students um, told us that that was their, their job goal, was to be a video game designer. All right, so segueing to COVID a little bit, all of us are dealing with Zoom meetings and being online, and some people on the spectrum, just like most people, don't love that. They don't necessarily enjoy it, although you, you did describe one student who really preferred participating remotely in things. Um, have you got any insight about helping students become used to using video chat or or using these different tools uh yeah i think um before they go into they need some you know basic training 
uh, around etiquette. Uh, you know, raise your hand if you want to say something. Don't interrupt people. Um, and I think everybody needs that uh, around Zoom. That's my experience. Um, and uh, you know, with connecting, uh, you know, the people get pretty frustrated sometimes when they aren't able to connect. Um, I think people just need lots of practice. Um, and uh, um, is it, well, that's what we're finding is that once people do it a few times, uh, it's a lot easier for them and things uh, go a lot more smoothly. So maybe just writing out those first experiences and trying to give a lot of encouragement, even if they don't well, go perfectly. And, and doing some practice. And what we're seeing is a lot of people who, who have uh, professional staff people, direct support professionals uh, working with them who don't understand it. So I think, you know, people need, we're trying to develop some tutorials um, for both people with disabilities and for their staff uh, and for others um, uh, about uh, some easy to understand tutorials about how to use the technology.